everyone, and welcome back. Um, in this video, we're going back to looking at our general preparation stage, the uh, setup period or the summer training portion of your cross-country season. This will be the first of a two-part series that's talking about mileage that might be appropriate uh, during the general preparation phase um, for a high schooler um, getting ready for their cross-country season. So um, part one, we're just looking basically at total volume. Okay, how much makes sense or what is just right for success in the cross country 5k because I think there is sort of this idea of, you know, not just what isn't what how what do you have to get to but what after a certain level of mileage when you get over a certain mileage per week, where does it sort of stop actually helping you and in some ways could actually hinder your your progress so sort of what is just right for the maximum development in the cross-country 5k and this is going to have us look really at something I've talked about in previous videos central vo2 max development there's a lot of different things that you need to do to get yourself ready for such a grueling long race as five kilometers and central vo2 max is one of the key aspects of that that really pairs in with total volume so we'll refresh our memory on what that is we'll talk about total volume and in part two we'll talk more about the quality of those miles how you might want to mix it up um, in terms of the percentage of your week that you might be getting different areas to develop other areas of um, a runner, not just central VO2 max. This is our boys team from Wharton High School in, two, in 2018. It's our varsity team, our top seven, um, right after our final VO2 max test in the general preparation phase. If you've seen from previous videos, I talk about doing... Um, your VO2 max test often so you know where um, the correct training intensity is for um, for you and your athletes. This was the last one we did. It was either the week, I think it was the week before school, so this was our starting seven, and this bared out to be our starting seven for almost all of the season um, in that um, in that time. So this is sort of what you're building towards. This was either last week or second to last week of general prep, just about to start racing. But what do you need to do before that point to get your kids successful to where they can be on your varsity team or if they're a new runner or whatever, just to get them as, as solid as they possibly can. And the first thing is looking at what's the right mileage for, for them in general prep. I'm Kyle Giacono. I'm the head boys cross country and track coach at Wharton High School in Tampa, Florida. And I have been for the last seven years. Closer look at my credentials are on the screen right now. All right, always critical before any type of training before saying this is my favorite workout you need to know what the metrics of the race actually is because if you don't know what the metrics of the race is that's like not knowing what's going to be on the test and then studying anyway right you need to know sort of what the guide is or what you need for success in that race so the study done by um, Ingham in 2008 which has been bared out by subsequent studies found that the 5k is um, whoever has the best or most developed VO2 max wins 94.3% of the time. They didn't look at you know second, third, or fourth place, but basically the idea is whoever has the best in this most of the time, you know, nine, almost 95% of the time, is going to win this race. And subsequently, the rest of it would probably bear out had they looked at it. But this is really showing how crucial VO2 max is, and one of the critical parts of that is central VO2 max, which we're going to talk about with the mileage here. From the USATF uh, distance curriculum, we will find that the 5K is run at race pace, best effort, meaning you didn't go out too fast and then die or didn't just walk it, is done at 97% of VO2 max, which again probably shows why there's that very close correlation. Whoever has the best VO2 max wins 94.3% of the time, and it's run very close to VO2 max, 97% of it. Again, that very close association. And the study that was released in 2018 by Dr. Matter and Dr. Hartman, which do a lot of the um, science-based look at things for the IAAF, um, and this was presented to us at our IAAF and, and USATF Level 3 um, training in 2000 and, um, 2018, just, you know, 2019, excuse me. Um, they found that the 5K, in terms of where the energy was coming from, from the three various ways that we can resupply or recharge ATP, 4% came from the alactic system or the available ATP and then the fossil creatine system, 10% from the anaero anaerobic glycolytic system, and 86% from the aerobic system. No shock there. Obviously, the lion's share comes from the aerobic system in a race that is so long, but to really kind of look at it, where that really breaks down, we'll see that 86% aerobic, 14% anaerobic when you add the two together. So with all that in mind, we really need to think about the law of training specificity. Okay, so what this law means, um, not to get too bogged down in, in training theory here, but essentially every training session that you do, you put yourself through or you put somebody else through if you're their coach, 
that training session has a very specific effect. If you do this, it will create this adaptation in whoever is running, right? So that that needs to be, be looked at. But you have to also realize that that very specific effect, doing this workout A results in effect A. Workout B results in effect B, okay? And that specific effect on the athlete, which may or may not be desired for the event, okay? The key part there, it's going to have an effect, okay? Is it helpful for the event? Yes or no? And that's sort of the idea of what's right for the 5K might be different than if you're training somebody for the 1600 or the 10K or the marathon or the 400. I mean, those are so very different events. The idea being is there's not one perfect workout and the way it's executed or just the design and everything that is perfect for everything. You have to understand that idea of the specificity of the training creates a specific effect and there's also going to be individuality to that, how certain people are affected by that specific training. There's going to be commonalities, obviously, but everybody's a little bit different, so you need to sort of look at that, right? Specific training effects on the athlete may or may not be good depending on the desired event, and what might be good for one event might not be appropriate for another, okay? So we need to really think about in, in this is when we're looking at general prep and cross country is how does mileage and general prep contribute to success in the cross country 5k that goes back to that idea of what's the right amount of miles and what we're looking at here today what is the right total volume to achieve this adaptation right so there's a lot of things that we need to look at we obviously we need to get this 4% right, we need to get this 10% right, but really what we're looking at a mileage here is the aerobic side of things, okay? Um, when we talk about sort of the, the breakdown of the quality of those miles, um, not really changing so much the energy systems here, but the different things that make up um, the cross-country race in part two, we'll sort of look at some of these other things, but really we're just looking at total mileage here and how that's going to contribute to our success in the cross-country 5K. All right, so with that in mind, we need to look at different aspects of VO2 max improvement because this is the key indicator for who wins this. So we need to look at the uh, two different areas that we can improve VO2 max. The first one I've already mentioned is central VO2 max improvement. And this is improved with just general aerobic work done for at least 20 continuous minutes. And really, um, it's... It starts improving after 20 continuous minutes. Um, that's after you're, you're in shape. So the first time you go out and run, it's really just, you know, it, it's great if you can get to a mile without starting, or stopping, excuse me. And that's not going to get you to 20 minutes, obviously. But after you've been doing it for a decent period of time, obviously, um, you're going to be in shape enough to where if you're not getting the 20 continuous minutes, you're not getting any truly central VO2 max improvement. Now, maybe there's other reasons you're doing it. Maybe you're cutting a workout short for... Um, maybe some kind of mental um, aspect you're trying to do, or maybe it's because of some sort of environmental thing. It's really, really hot or whatever, or maybe you're going to altitude and you're trying to acclimate a little bit and you're just doing a little bit of, of aerobic work and you don't want to go crazy with it. That's one thing. But if you're talking about central VO2 max improvement, it starts at 20 continuous minutes, right? Um, this can include things like intervals or um, starting and stopping workouts, provided the heart rate doesn't drop too much. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. Central VO2 max improves generally as the body increases the ability to move oxygen from the heart outward. So consider the heart to be the central part of central VO2 max, right? How are we getting your body better at getting oxygen from your heart outward? And you might think, well, why aren't we thinking about the lungs outward? And the reason being is your lungs really don't adapt to training. They're sort of overdeveloped organs to begin with. Um... You don't really talk about your your lungs becoming better um, at at you know after training or something like that because they're overdeveloped to begin with. So it really sort of starts the bottleneck of moving oxygen through your body really starts at the heart. How can we get the left ventricle to pump more blood um, and and your body carry more blood and all that all the way through. The reason why um, oxygen is sort of the issue and getting it outward is that's the bottleneck for all aerobic work here. Um, our body can store uh, different things that it uses for um, locomotion. You know, it can store different types of fuel sources, fats, carbohydrates, and under extreme conditions, proteins. Um, you know, it can store some water for about a day or so. But oxygen is is the one thing that your body is not designed to store for a couple good reasons. One, hopefully we're never in a situation where we don't have access to oxygen for more than a, a minute or two. Um, but also, oxygen is very corrosive, so if we were storing it, we'd have to have some kind of mechanism to not have it kill us at a very young age. So um, that's sort of the thing here. So we need to figure out how to get our body better equipped because we're not naturally designed for that. And that comes from the training and training of central VO2 max. How can we get this oxygen from the heart outward? 
The key to essential VO2 max improvement is continuous runs of at least 20 minutes. I say low intensity here, but really it's just anything continuous um, as you're doing this. Um, it, it's just easiest done at low intensity because the idea being that you can do more of this kind of work. Um, in a video I did on tempo running, I said one of the things that um, scares me off from doing uh, what... what Really, what should scare a lot of coaches off from it is that tempo runs, because of the increased intensity, can have you compromise in the volume. Obviously, also, when you're doing things like a two-mile test, well, two miles isn't very long um, for someone who's in shape aerobically. So those are the different things. So that's where sort of the focus usually is. This is why you think of central VO2 max on things like your long runs and your recovery runs, and those are sort of the champions of it. That's where you're going to get a lot of your, your v central VO2 max development from. But I'll show you later on how you can also expand it for your, your tempo runs. But also on things like your, your VO2 max days and even your shorter days, how you can get some central VO2 max also. On these days, volume is the intensity, um, so you don't need to emphasize as fast as pace possible when you're just focusing on central VO2 max. But I, as I said, I can also show you how to get some extra uh, uh, central VO2 max development in some other ways here toward the end of the video. All right, the other type of, of VO2 max, which we're not going to deal with in this video, is peripheral VO2 max. This is improved from aerobic power work only. It's done at 98 to 101 percent. I did a whole video series on VO2 max testing, but more importantly, VO2 max intervals, where I really talk about this in detail. And I'll talk about this in the part two video, where we talk about the quality of the different breakdown of where your miles are coming from in general prep. Um, but that's the important thing: is um, being in that zone. Um, this will not improve unless the in, in the intensity is too slow or too fast. So there is a very narrow window there. Um, if it's too slow, your body won't get the energy, won't build energy expensive structures due to um, it's not being right at the point of oxygen debt. And if it's too fast, your blood is going to be moving too fast, quickly past the working muscle, so it's not going to warrant myoglobin um, production. I talk about this a lot in that video on intervals, but this is what pulls the oxygen off your blood, which we move from central VO2 max development, and pulls it into the working muscles. Another very important aspect that we're going to deal with in that part two video a little bit, but if you want a full breakdown description about um, VO2 max intervals in the description down below. Generally improves that the body increases the ability of the working muscles to extract oxygen from the blood for use in the mitochondria. So central VO2 max moves the oxygen from the center, from the heart outward. Peripheral VO2 max is how you get it from it being outward into the working muscles where your body can actually use it in the mitochondria for um, the curb cycle and aerobic respiration. Key to peripheral VO2 max is running right at current VO2 max. Um, these are current. These are somewhat high intensity and volume days, so they can only happen once per microcycle. Um, and I'll talk about these a little bit later on and how these break down in your general prep cycle when you're looking at mileage. Okay, so why does central in this case VO2 max improve? You're going to see. Um, the peripheral VO2 max here, but the central ones are going to be um, highlighted and I'll talk about. This is in respect to your aerobic system. What aerobic system improvements happen that also lead to the improvement of central VO2 max development? Well, you're going to have more aerobic enzymes. Enzymes are um, help anything, any process in your body from ha to happen. So the idea being of producing energy aerobically with the curb cycle and mitochondria and all this, you're going to have more enzymes so you can produce it um, better, faster, more um, more of the energy aerobically. You're going to get more mitochondria. And you see that bigger there is not highlighted because that's from peripheral VO2 max. But you're going to have more mitochondria. They're going to be thriving because you're going to be giving up so many miles. Um, your you're going to be showing your body, hey, we're going to be doing a lot of aerobic work because of all these miles we're doing. We better produce and build some more mitochondria so that we can help um, and use all the aerobic enzymes and everything else we're doing as we move more oxygen through the body. Your red blood cells are just going to generally improve. They're going to be better at um, moving the oxygen and everything through your body. This is where the bottleneck starts at the center. The bigger um, your heart's going to get bigger, but most specifically the left ventricle. That's what pumps the blood. That's really what moves it everywhere. That's what's going to get um, bigger from central VO2 max development and, and the miles you're going to be doing. Increased muscle capillarization. This is actually not the um, the proper term for this, but it makes more sense if I say capillarization. It's going to be uh, you're going to have more capillaries, so you're going to be able to move more blood from the left ventricle. It's going to be more improved blood. You're going to have more mitochondria in that, but you're just going to be, through the different working muscles, you're going to have more pathways to send this improved red blood cells that is going to be rich with oxygen. You're going to have more overall blood, too. This is the reason why you would not want your, um, your distance runners two weeks before, say, the state meet donating blood, because... Um, you're going to be able to add about an extra liter, half a liter to a liter of blood after about six months of training. That's more potential 
oxygen carrying capacity for your working muscles. So that is going to improve your central VO2 max. Athletes are also going to be getting older. That has nothing to do with any type of VO2 max, but throughout an entire season, they're going to get older if they're high schoolers, and that's just going to improve their VO2 max in general also, but has nothing to do obviously with training. All right, so all of these adaptations, these um, aerobic adaptations involve structural and nature type improvements. So you're going to be building some body structures in some way, right? Building mitochondria, enzymes, bigger heart. You're changing the way the body is structured. And that requires a lot of time to fully develop, 20 plus weeks. Um, we're going to be going to the calendar here in a little bit. But the idea being is if you are looking at this, and it's why um, the fictitious microcycle we've been talking about in the series is 23 weeks plus 20 weeks, we're going to have time for all this to be developing. And and we need to look at the right type of mile so we can maximize the improvements as we um, look at um, the, the rest of this presentation. Other beneficial adaptations for central VO2 max, your muscular system, slow twitch muscle fibers are going to be enhanced. Um, slow twitch muscle fibers, the aerobic muscle fibers. It used to be thought that um, they couldn't get bigger with running. Well, actually, some recent studies have come out to find that you can actually improve it with about six months of training. They're going to get 9% bigger. And we don't want to have our distance runners super big, but the idea being is they're getting better. They're being enhanced by this type of work. And, and for a while, there was a lot of question if that was actually happening with low intensity running. It actually has been found out now from a couple studies that have come out. Having more capillaries and increased mitochondria is actually going to be important in terms of um, muscular system because it's how you're supplying the muscles with energy and increased running economy. You're using less energy in the working muscles to get from point A to point B. That's going to allow you to produce more energy and that's all tied in with central VO2 max. And the metabolic systems, you're going to increase the stores of fat use and glycogen, which is stored glucose, you're going to store it closer to the working muscles and you're going to store more of it and it's going to be more readily used by things like the enzymes that are being used here. That's, a, that's also a metabolic um, adaptation and it's also going to be running economy is also the in the metabolic side of things also. So in short, everything we just said here, aerobic, muscular, and metabolic adaptations associated with central VO2 max development come from continue, continuous or near continuous workouts, right? So this can be active recovery also going on here. So that's sort of the in short. Minimum of 20 continuous minutes to start. Um, I realize I misspelled continuous there. That should be continuous, not continues. Um, minutes to start. These adaptations within the workout. After 20 minutes, okay, so this is the really important thing here, okay? So this is what it's all building. I said 20 minutes. Where is that coming from? Where am I getting 20 minutes from? Okay, it can be after 20 minutes, you can have very short breaks, okay? And I'll talk about how short that is in a little bit. The body starts to release several hormones responsible for all the adaptations we just talked about. The aerobic ones we talked about in the previous side, as well as most, if not all, the muscular and metabolic system improvements that we are dealing with here, okay? So the hormones, the studies that we've looked at uh, that have sort of bared this out, there's more of them here, some of the more landmark ones. Um, one of the first ones in 1999, here is what the, uh, the, the main or the, uh, the title per, um, author of the actual study and the actual name of the study, if you want to look it up yourself, talking about metabolic and hormonal changes, aerobic exercise and distance runners. And then um, a little more than 10 years later in 2011, um, aerobic exercise training adaptations are increased. And these are basically just some different um, ideas that we're storing more of the fuel source and it's being used in different ways through your body. So there's actually a, a ton of different studies that sort of bear this out. These are two of the bigger ones. If you want to take a closer look, please um, don't take my word for it. Look at the studies yourself. But basically, all of these thing, all these studies found that 20 minutes, for whatever reason, was sort of that magic number. And the idea being is your body needs to be convinced to make these changes. These changes are energy expensive. Energy is calories, and calories is survival. So I think the idea behind it is you have to really convince your body to do this. And I think 20 minutes just must be, for whatever reason, biological. And that's sort of the main idea. There might be some people that it takes a little bit less. Maybe it's 18 minutes in some people and 22 in other. But that should be sort of the barometer. 20 continuous minutes and how can we maximize that but that should be sort of the the important really the starting point of the workout that's where things are really going to start happening that make all these central vo2 max improvements start to happen so as we're looking at the rest of these and how we can make these workouts happen just think about that in your mind that 20 minutes and that's really going to kind of bear out a lot of 
the decisions that I've sort of made for myself and I think should be the guiding principles as you make for either your own training or whoever it is you are training. So we're going to keep that important aspect up top, the 20 minutes continuous to start these adaptations within the workout. We're going to keep that in short at the very top as we add to our understanding of this. So what kind of continuous workouts are we doing here in general prep that we want to maximize? Well, aerobic threshold or your easy pace workouts, these are done at 65 to 70 percent. These are these really low intensity workouts that are really just about bulk miles. These are sort of the hallmarks of central VO2 max. This is where you're going to get most of your central VO2 max improvement, okay? At um, 85 or 65 to 70 percent of V or the velocity at which your body reaches VO2 max. I did a whole couple of videos on um, these two aerobic threshold workouts that are in the description down below if you want to see how that is calculated with limited breaks of 30 to 60 seconds. The reason being is I always tell my kids 30 seconds with the idea being that they might stop for if they need water 45, but hopefully it never gets to 60 because you risk getting out of the continuous range, right? If 20 minutes is the idea, then we absolutely need to make sure that if we go for 30 minutes, stop and get water, make sure that's only 30 minutes so that if we 30 seconds so that when we start up again, we're not starting a second run and having to go 20 continuous minutes to get back in that range. So that's why that that really short break is there. You can stop, you can get water, you need to get water, especially where we are in Tampa, Florida in summertime, you need to get some more hydration in there. But it needs to be literally just to get some water and go, not to be to let your heart rate get out of that aerobic threshold training, which is a minimum of 120 beats per minute as you're actually looking at it. So that's the risk of getting out of the continuous range. The first one of these is the long run should serve to push central VO2 max and aerobic adapt adaptations to their limit. This is the absolute hallmark champion workout of central VO2 max development. This is where you're going to get the biggest bang for your buck when you're trying to develop this in yourself or your kids. Pushes these adaptations to their current limit. And they should be 20 to 22% of your weekly volume in one shot, okay? If you're doing 40 miles in a week, your long run should be 8 miles. If you're doing 50 miles in a week, your long run should be 10 miles. And there's that little bit of variation there because very rarely does it end up landing right on a nice round number like that. So you've got that little variation of 22%. If you're going less than that, you are not pushing your central VO2 max and aerobic adaptations to their limit. You're leaving something on the table, okay? These should be done one per week. And I do, in the video series, I kind of show you where you could break these down in a fictitious um, cycle, just kind of refreshing that. Recovery runs, these are going to serve to add miles and improve that central VO2 max and aerobic adaptations while also recovering for more intense work. So these are sort of the stepping stones, right? You do something more intense the day before, then you can get a recovery run. It shouldn't be easy day, hard day. I hate when people kind of look at it as easy day, hard day, but it serves to develop your central VO2 max in a, in a way that makes sense but also helping you recover. That's the side benefit from more intense work that you've also done in your microcycles. Again, uh, sort of the idea, the textbook idea of recovery run is 30 to 60 minutes. Um, I think that the perfect idea of that is right at about 45 minutes, right in the middle, and I'll show you why that is, and it sort of makes sense from the 20 continuous minutes. Um, and you're going to do multiple of these a week. This is really the only workout you're going to do multiple times. I say per week in general prep because that's my microcycle. The microcycle for me changes as I add more workouts, but I only have about seven different workouts I need to get. Not even seven different workouts, seven things I need to get done in a week. So in my microcycle, so I can leave it to a week. So that's why I say multiple per week in this time of year. And the other type of continuous workout you're going to be doing is lactic threshold, tempo, fartlet type workouts. Anything that's pushing that lactic threshold. Um, the idea being that a lot of times these are called tempo workouts, um, fartlet workouts where you're starting and stopping. Um, you're picking up to um, lactic threshold pace or maybe something a little bit faster like critical velocity. Those are different ways that you can get that um, accomplished, but they're all continuous just like the long run and the recovery run. These are done in a wider range. Um, 78 for more your um, lesser experienced people that do not have the infrastructures in place. Up to 92%, this is actually critical velocity. I do a whole workout video where I talk about the, the, the different things that you can do with lactic threshold. I would definitely look at it. Don't just pick a random number in here because there's different reasons why you would do it. It's in the description down below. It's talking about, I think it's like tempo time is the name of that workout, but it's about lactic threshold development in general prep. It's 78 to 92% of VVO2 max with limited breaks just like up here because it is continuous. Anything that you're doing in a break should be very limited, 30 to 60 seconds. Same as the risk above about getting out of that range. Um, these tempo slash critical, critical velocity runs serve to continue pushing v, uh, the VVO2 max 
um, central Vivia 2 Max and um, aerobic adaptations while adding the idea of you're going to also have some other things going on here. You're adding more fuel stores. Um, you're recruiting different muscles in different ways and more running economy. But in terms of VO2 Max or central VO2 Max development, it's going to continue to do that because it's more than 20 continuous minutes that we talked about here. But these do add some different things to your adaptations like running economy, fuel stores, muscle recruitment that we'll talk about in part two of this video. You're going to do one of these per week also. So those are continuous. So those make sense. So as long as you don't don't give them too much of a break or give yourself too much of a break. There's no danger here of getting out of that range and you're going to get the central VO2 max development along with if you're doing tempo running um, in some respect, um, the other adaptations that you might be looking for from that type of workout. Okay, so should we double run to add um, miles? I have kids that will say this, especially ones that are you know coming back a couple times and want to push their volume. So let's keep this main principle up top the 20 continuous minutes, okay? And think about this when we ask ourselves, should we double run to add miles? And I think there's two things to look at with double runs. One we'll talk about here, one we'll talk about later. So in short, no for most high schoolers. That is most high schoolers, right? You've got your kids that maybe they start running your, your first year and they're going to run for, for four years competitively. Um, maybe they're going to go out into college and they're going to do something else when they get to college. But for you, maybe in high school, which is really what I'm talking about a lot here, or a person who's new to running, starting this for the first time, even if you're more developed um, than, than a high schooler, um, maybe a 30-something starting doing this, you really there, there's no real benefit to doubling at this level for a couple of different reasons. All right, the first one we're talking about is the 20 rule means it would be better served to link these runs together, okay? And here's a scenario. We've got lo one long run. Say it goes 90 minutes, and this is what I'll advocate for in, say, July time frame. And say it's about 12 miles. You've got a high school boy who's cruising at about 7.30 pace. You'd get right at um, 12 miles in 90 minutes. That's going to equal about 70 minutes of central VO2 max development. We're going to take off the 20 minutes to set up. We're going to get 70 minutes of central VO2 max development in this long run. Okay, That is maximizing the time in the miles. Provided we didn't take any stupid long breaks, we didn't stop and you know talk with somebody at the water station, we didn't start looking around at deer or just lose our minds and just stop running for some reason, about 70 minutes of central VO2 max development. Now, let's go ahead and break that up into two different runs of 45 minutes each because we want to double. Okay, and each of them will be six miles, exactly half of that. Okay, you're only going to get about 50 minutes of central VO2 max development because we had to get into the 20 minute range the second time. The first run we went out and we got 20 minutes to set up, and then we had 25 minutes of development. We came back, you know, 10 hours later, 12 hours later, whatever, and we did the same thing. That's only about 50 minutes of central VO2 max development. You left 20 minutes on the table. We did not maximize the miles here. There was an extra 20 minutes of wasted miles, about probably two and a half-ish miles there, a little bit more of it, that were not serving you in any way in terms of central VO2 max development, right? This matters over time. You do it once or twice. Maybe something happens. You're in a long run, and there's a horrible lightning storm, and you got to get out of there. That's for safety reasons, but if you're actually doing it in terms of a systematic approach, you do this over time and you think you're doing more for yourself, you are losing 20 minutes per week of development, but you're not getting any relief in terms of the actual miles you're running. So you're getting all the pounding of running without all the benefits, right? And there is something to be said for reducing recovery time. So maybe you go out and you run your first workout in the morning at 7.30 and you do this first run and you come back at 7.30. Well, your body got 12 hours of recovery and now before the next run the next day, it's only got another 12 hours of recovery. Where if you had strung it all together at the beginning, you would have had 24 hours of recovery. And especially for a high schooler, I mean, you can definitely get away with this more as the older you get. But for a high school that's also going through growth and maturation as well as school and everything else that's going on, I just think that's setting yourself up for, for a disaster. Now, you might say, well, I'm going to do the long run, but I want to add in some extra miles elsewhere. Well, I think I might answer your question a little bit later on about why this doesn't make sense, but this is simply with the 20 continuous minutes in mind why you might not want to do that. Okay. Also, physiologists generally accept the idea that um, for safety reasons, double running will only need it once you get to 65 plus miles per week. So that's sort of the idea is once you get to 65, about 65 miles, in terms of getting the miles in safely, physiologists say that's sort of the idea where if you start doing all of that together, 
it's more safe, it's safer to do it by splitting it up. Okay, so 65 plus miles a week, okay? And we will see later that it's not really needed for the specifics of the cross-country 5K. So that's what I'm talking about later on. We'll talk about it later on. But for right now, the idea being 20 continuous minutes is the reason why you wouldn't do it here. And this is sort of a sneak peek to what we'll talk about a little bit later on about the 65 plus miles per week. Okay, some may benefit from double running. Some may. This is a not for most. Okay, no for most high schoolers, it doesn't make sense. For most runners, it doesn't make sense. But some may benefit from doubling. So this is the idea that there's going to be, um, this would be the exception to your rule. Okay, maybe you have a very, very advanced runner. Maybe somebody who's been running since they were in sixth grade and, and there's you're looking for different ways to push them. Maybe you think their VO2 max is really developed because they've been doing a lot of very specific training for five, six, seven years. And there is something to be said that after a while, VO2 max is really going to kind of plateau and you need to find other ways to push them that might be the exception but this is not going to be your herd of people that you're training you know I've got about 25 people that we're training 25 to 30 people right now before we get our new group of freshmen for this year and for, for, for most of those group you're just not you're not going to advocate something like this so there might be that very rare situation but again very advanced runners maybe you've got some individuality for people that would benefit from this but again treat this as a very case-by-case -case basis make sure that it really sort of is just, again, the exception to that rule. All right, so continuing back to the question of how do we maximize our miles, there are some other workouts we're going to be doing that are not continuous, and how can we get as much central VO2 max development while not, you know, messing up the focus on some of those other days when we talk a little bit about the, the quality of the miles or the different types of miles in part two, I'll really focus on these, but um, you've got intervals and repetition type workouts that you're going to be looking to do in your general preparation phase, and how can we stretch this out to a point where we can also get some side benefits while we're focusing on some other things. Well, we've got our VO2 max and aerobic power workouts. These are done at 98 to 101 percent of current VVO2 max with a worthwhile break. And you say, well, this break, throw your hands up and say there's nothing that we can do. Um, we already talked about the idea of 20 continuous minutes and obviously VO2 max. One of the tests for that is 10 minutes max effort. We can't do 20 minutes, so there's no point. There's no reason to do it. But the idea being is we can squeeze out some central VO2 max development with our active recovery, which there's a lot of reasons why you would want to do this. Clearing acid is the biggest one. We're only going to have one of these per week, but it's the active recovery nature of this. And if done right, you can make a workout. Let's say you're doing four times mile repeats with of recovery stringing them together not letting the your, your heart rate drop too much we can string those four miles together with active recovery add about another mile or so in there in between now we've got five miles continuous we've got the vo2 max work that we needed on that day the the aerobic power and we've got the central vo2 max also because we've strung everything together here so intervals um at goal pace, meaning the goal pace of 98 to 101, not goal pace for your actual race. Um, I should have probably used a different term there. With equal time, active recovery. If it's done right, meaning you go right into it, you know, they come across the finish line, they probably catch their breath for a second, and then you're like, all right, active recovery, go, and they start jogging around, maybe they get a drink or whatever. Their heart rate after doing something this fast, two-mile pace, is not going to drop out of the zone if you're doing equal work um, to time off, right, if you're doing the active recovery. Um, it's just, it's not going to drop enough. They've done enough high intensity work. They're not going to drop out of 120 before the next rep. As long as you're not letting them just stand on the line the whole time, you know, you get them right into that next rep, you can make this happen. Okay. You can also add a cool down and I'll talk about this a little bit more extensively here in a second. Um, we also have this idea of tests, races, um, best effort with, um, a long cool down to clear acid and to add central VO2 max. So obviously in a test, so we've got a two mile test. Well, there is no interval period to add to this. So we've got a two mile test. Well, you know, there's nothing that we can do there because after a two mile test, there's no way that even I, you know, I do a lot of, um, active recovery. I would never say, all right, immediately throw on your trainers. Sometimes they'll even do this in spikes and go out. They're going to need a second just mentally to collect themselves. But if you add on your VO2 max day, a uh, three to four mile cool down, well, obviously that's going to be longer than two miles. Um, a three mile cool down is probably going to get you to 25 to maybe 30 minutes, depending on how they're going. A four mile cool down is going to be about 35 minutes. Well, now you've gotten it in there too, and you're also clearing the acid. So you would always want to do a cool down anyway, okay? So the idea being is if you throw that in there on the test runs, um, you know, if you're going to tell them to go on a, really, you're going to clear all the acid after probably about 10, 15 minutes, might as well keep going and get some extra central VO2 max development. That's how you can keep your miles in check for the week. Strength runs, these are done at best pace that can be maintained 
to max pace, kind of depending on what you're doing here. Okay, worthwhile or a complete break between bouts of work with active recovery. So that's the important thing here. You're going to have one to two of these per week. You're only going to have, when I say one to two, you're going to have a hill run and or maybe an alactic or vice versa. You might have both, but you would not do two short hill intervals in a work in a week or two a lactic type workouts so you might have both of them in a week you might have only one of them in a week but you would never have the same thing twice in a week if that makes sense so short hill intervals all these video oh, these workouts again i have videos in the description down below if you want them broken down so please don't think i'm just breezing right through those they're not the main point here but if these are done at best pace that can be maintained you're gonna have the active recovery so you go up the short hill you immediately start your recovery just like on the intervals here boom you've got you know if you're doing maybe eight short hill intervals that's going to take more than 20 minutes to complete um you're going to get some central vo2 max development right there then you're probably going to add a cool down not really to um, really have any acid um clearing on these days but it's going to add some central vo2 max development and also have the idea that the total miles for the week that we've talked about here isn't going to slip and same basic idea, the A-lactic, you're going to do fly, I, I advocate doing fly 30, so you do your 30s, you decelerate, you jog maybe all the way around your track or wherever it is you're doing it, you give yourself three to four minutes in between at that jog, your heart rate's not going to drop all that much, you're going to keep that heart rate over about 120, and you're going to keep going all the way through those, and you're also going to add a cool down. So the idea being is on the intervals or the repetition days, if you do the active recovery right, you can continue to have central VO2 max and development, and on all three of these days, you're going to have some kind of long cool down. So just keep that in mind. As long as it's over 20 minutes, you're going to have some more central VO2 max development. So the side benefits of central VO2 max development on days when you're focusing on some other things. And we'll talk about in part two how these should all sort of break down in terms of the percentage, but that's for the next video. Okay, so I talked about earlier the idea of um, uh, uh, the idea of you don't need to double until you get over 65 miles per week, and that's sort of alluding to what we're going to talk about on this slide. What is the maximum miles for VO2 max growth? Okay, and there is some that, that has actually been studied. So success in the 5K is most linked to VO2 max growth. We already talked about that from the study from Ingham in 2008. VO2 max stops developing when someone reaches about 65 miles per week. It doesn't mean that over 65 miles per week, you're not going to get any VO2 max mode. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is after you get to that threshold, more miles don't add to that development. So that's sort of the cap out, 65. You go over that, okay, and that's been bared out by a bunch of different studies over time. That is basically said. There's some variation there, but 65 is sort of that indicator. Just like 20 minutes is the indicator for the start of the development. Once you get to 65, adding miles after that do not get you any more VO2 max development. Okay? I mean, after 65 miles per week, there are going to be other adaptations that do keep happening. Running economy, fuel stores, um, different things do continue to develop. It. So I'm not saying that there's no reason why you would ever run more than 65 miles per week. But will this add for success in the 5K? This is what we're looking at. The specific demands of the race should be the focus of the training. 5K is focus on how do you get VO2 max to develop the most. In this video, we're talking about central VO2 max development. And if that, if VO2 max stops improving at 65 miles per week, why would we run more than 65 miles per week? Sure, there are going to be some other things dealing with here, but... This makes sense if you're going to go more than 65 per miles per week if you're dealing with a race like the 10K or longer where running economy is more tied to success. This is why your college runners, especially your college men, are going to double. It's also why the college men are going to do more tempo type runs because that's more important to success in that race. We're dealing with the 5K. So for me, when you look at all these studies that have found that 65 is sort of that, that top end, we kind of have the top end number for the miles per week that we really should be doing if the 5K is the focus, okay? And this brings up that question again about why double running is not needed for 5K success, okay? So with, with that, let me go back here just to focus on it. So this again shows that double running. So we said double running is not good because of that 20 continuous minutes, right? It's better to link them together. But you might have a kid that says, all right, coach, I want to do the long run, but I want to add some more miles also on a recovery run day. I want to do two of those recovery run days so I can get more miles. Well, why would we do that if anything over 65 miles per week doesn't help us in our central VO2 max development? Again, there might be that exception for a kid who you're trying to push running economy in a really important way. Maybe you think their VO2 max has already stopped developed because they've just been training for so long. There's exceptions to that rule. But if you're dealing with VO2 max, 
65 miles per week really does end this top end limit on miles. Okay, from this top end limit, we can now start to create target range for general prep mileage. All that being said, everything we've looked at, now we can start to focus on this idea. We've got our top end. All right, 65 miles per week. We don't want to go over that because it's just sort of wasted. It's not wasted miles, but it's not specific to the event that we're really looking at. Again, you might have some people that would improve in some respects, but for the mass vast majority, that's the top end. Okay? So now, this is giving you my end on my view on miles in general prep, okay? Physiologists give you that top end of 65 miles per week. I've talked about the idea of the 20 continuous minutes and what you can actually reasonably do with a high school kid um, in general prep. This is my view. This is only my view in this slide. Please do not treat it as anything other than that. And I have changed this over time, okay? When I started, I had my runners target about 30 to 40 miles per week, okay? That should already be red flags because the idea being, wow, that doesn't really seem to make sense. You're not really getting close to that 65 miles per week. You're probably leaving a lot of central VO2 max development on the table, right? And that's absolutely right because I was focusing way too much on tempo or faster intensity, right? This was pre-2017, um, really 2018 track season me, and it really sort of bears out in, in our results that we got. We're not nearly what they could have been. So um, I slowly started to increase this over two years. So please do not, if you're doing 30 miles per week, jump right up to what I'm saying might make the most sense if you're trying to maximize it. So I had a group of kids that I've been working with a number of years. I needed to, for lack of a better term, that idea of when, when you get a new fish, you don't just dump it into the water of your fish tank. You let it sit in the water a little bit, kind of get acclimated to it. I needed to slowly and smartly get my group over a two-year time span up to what was probably more appropriate for focusing on central VO2 max development. So in December 2017, um, I went to USATF Level 2 training. I would highly recommend it. This was completely eye-opening. This has really shifted my whole perspective on things. They really look at the science of coaching and the art of coaching. Um, really recommend it if you have a chance to do it. Um, and I decided, again, to slowly increase my mileage, and I didn't just want to jump right up. So we were at 30 to 40 miles per week out of that cross-country season, so we're going into track 2018, increase it to 40 to 50. Next cross-country season, 45 to 55 again, slowly getting it up. 2019 in track, I kept it the same. The idea being is, well, cross-country should be a little bit longer. And then 2019, we got up to 50 to 60. This is where I've landed on right now. It's what we did um, last cross country season it's um what we're planning to do for our 2020 cross country season so that's the idea of getting it up to that point smartly okay this is what i shoot for today and that's th that was i mostly focused with the boys i also work with some of the girls on our team so the idea being is there's sort of a range here so today this is what i shoot for high school varsity boys varsity boys your top end group okay 50 to 60 miles per week in cross country general prep okay I'd say about 45 to 55 in track. It's a little bit less. High school girls, I shoot for about 45 to 55 miles per week in cross country, 40 to 50 in track. And actually, this is sort of an interesting thing. A lot of people think that girls' miles need to be a little bit less, and, and it does more based on time. The interesting thing is that girls actually can and should handle more volume for longer into the season, meaning as you're peaking your boys, your girls can actually handle it for longer into the season, and they actually should because of the way that the slight difference between the way girls and boys adapt to this type of work, okay? Um, longer in the season because they get their strength gains. Girls get their strength gains improvements from human growth hormone primarily. Boys primarily get it from testosterone. Obviously, girls do produce some testosterone and boys obviously produce hormone growth human growth hormone but where are they getting their primary primary strength gains boys are getting it mostly from testosterone which you need to drop at the end of the season because it's something that kind of can break things um, down and, and different if you want it to be maximized you need to reduce miles per week um, because testosterone goes up as you um, are using different um, different areas of your um, metabolism. So if you want testosterone to go up at the end of the season, you need to drop the miles a little bit for boys. Girls, we're not getting a lot of the gains from testosterone, so they can actually handle more of it because, again, human growth hormone is primarily where girls are going to be getting their strength gains, so they can handle a little bit more. That might be a discussion for a later video, but that's just kind of an interesting side note. So those in lesser training groups, this is so, this is the idea, this is varsity. But what about those kids that obviously are not going to be doing 90 miles, or uh, 90 miles, 90 minutes, they're not going to get to 12 miles. Well, but that's the idea, is you want to keep the 
time on point, right? Those in your lesser training groups, your your JV kids that are hoping to get on varsity or your, your brand new kids, use a time indicator is what I do, okay? I found this typically keeps the volume for the week in regards to the long run on point, okay? So the idea being is maybe you're doing a, a, a week when you're doing 60 miles per week, okay? That would mean a long run of 12 miles. That's 20%. That's about 90 minutes for that group. I don't like going any longer than 90 minutes. I think it just, it's the idea of, it, it takes a lot of recovery time out of that point. It should be a 24 hour recovery for a long run. If you have your other groups, and again, you know, not your first day out with your kid, you might need to have them, maybe it's a kid that joins you right at um, the start of cross country season. Um, cross country summer, they graduate from middle school, they got all their paperwork or however you do it in, in your area and they come and join you in June. Maybe by August they might be able to do this, but probably not. This is more your kid that would maybe be coming back, depending on how you're doing it. But if you have that kid go for 90 minutes, maybe they're able to go, I don't know, nine miles, 10 miles, something like that. What I find is that it ends up lining up to where their long run is in that 20 to 22 percent range for what their total miles per week is going to be. If you have them on the recovery run go for 45 minutes, your topping kids it's going to be about six miles. Your lesser kids that maybe that only is ending up being about four and a half miles, it ends up making the total weekly volume more times than not. When I go and I look at it, it's almost always on point. So that's how you can kind of do it. So kind of keep the time and the miles the focus for your your top end groups and then these groups just keep that time indicator and almost always um, makes it all sort of work out all right so here is the fictitious uh, macro cycle that we've been looking at through all these different videos for planning out your cross-country general prep um, and whole macro cycle um, Again, this is totally fictitious. It was just if I was looking at a perfect world um, where I would start with a state meet or peaking on um, November 7th, um, giving us 23 weeks starting here at the very, very end of May. Um, this would be, um, I'm actually filming this um, on the day when this could have started. Here in Tampa, Florida, we're not allowed to work with our kids until at the earliest June 15th. So this is 100% fictitious, just in a perfect world, what could be happening. So um, it would be a good idea if you wanted 23 weeks and your state meet was on November 7th to have some of your work starting here today. If you have a different state meet or a different peaking cycle, you might want to look at it a little bit differently. So the idea being is in the first week, it's just a transitional week. It's not even part of our general prep. It was just to get up and start moving again after about two weeks off. I gave um, in a perfect world one, two, three weeks off. And then you just kind of start doing some things with just some easy runs, three miles, 20 to 30 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes. About, and again, the mileage I'm going to be looking at here is again that, that top end boy that we were talking about in the previous slide. I'm a varsity boy, um, your top seven or so. It's going to be about right based on the pace. So 10 miles total in that first week. Certainly, we're not maximizing anything. We're just getting ourselves back on our feet. But really get started with general prep here in June. And so what you'll see here are all the workouts we've talked about in previous weeks. All I've added is the approximate miles based on adding time for the actual workout. And then total miles here along with some other things going on like a cool down. So... If there is a core workout and a long cool down, you'll notice there'll be a little dash in the workouts. If it's just a continuous run, I just write like the first year, one here, recovery run, 35 to 40 minutes, it'll be about five miles. Next one, recovery run, 35 to 40 minutes. I'm gonna give them the option to do some pickups I talked about. Um, this is basically a fartlek run, five miles still, short hill intervals. Um, so we've got two parts of the workout, the core workout and the cool down. Um, four to five of them with two miles will get us to about or about or at least 20 minutes um, we've got five miles recovery run 35 to 40 five miles again long run and what you'll see in each of these weeks is the total miles for the week is highlighted all the way over here and then I also have the long run highlighted with the percentage of the weekly miles if we get there based on that remember we're looking for 20 to 22 percent and this is how you might make it all work so again the idea of um, I'm looking for once we get fully into it about 50 to 60 miles well it's gonna take us about a month to get to that point so we never get to 50 miles here in this first fictitious week you got to slowly get yourselves back up to it you don't want to add more than about 10 ish 20 percent once you get to about 40 miles a week you want to definitely make sure that you're increasing the first one from 10 to 30 that that 34 that doesn't count but once you're kind of at this point you want to be smart about how you're slowly increasing it so you'll kind of see each week it'll probably tick up just a little bit um, in this fictitious plan. So we've got seven miles, 
um, for the long run here, 50 to 55 minutes, that's going to be 20.5% because it's a 34 mile week. If we'd gotten an extra mile for 35, it would have been 20%. Um, coming into the second week, we've got the same thing. This would be a week that they could be doing um, seven days. I'll do a whole video on um, off days and things like that, which you kind of notice probably if you've looked at this before. Um, typically about every other week, it's a mandated day off. They do not have to do anything on Sunday, but at least my... Um, my varsity kids are going to run um, no matter what. I have to tell them not to. So basically, I mandate that they take a day off every other week at the very least. They can certainly do it every week if they want to. But knowing my, my top end group, they're going to do it. They're only going to take off if I absolutely tell them to. Um, but again, I'll do a whole video series on that. But that's how you kind of see it. It'll kind of tick up um, a little bit, like from week one to week two, because they've got a full week of running here. It ticked up about six miles. But then the next week, because it'll be an, uh, there'll be the mandated off day, it's only going to tick up a little bit because they're going to be increasing miles here, but they've had a total day off from running. You'll see that'll really obviously cut into the total of weekly miles when you have one day of zero, obviously. So looking here at the second week, um, the idea we've got here in the VO2 max test the first time, only go about two miles the first time. We're still only dealing with kids that are, you know, 30 to 40 miles a week, so don't go crazy with the long cool down jet. Ease into it, okay? Recovery run, now we're up to 45 minutes. This is kind of like where I like my recovery runs to be, 45 minutes. Um, I'll go out to 60 when need be for the volume, but that's where I think the real perfect um, nature is where they can come back and they can really do anything the next day. So that ends up being about six miles. Tempo run, I do it based on time, so 20 to 25 minutes, gets about four miles. Typically with the top end group, I'll tell them go four miles and it'll be in that range, and then the other groups, I'll say 20 to 25 minutes. And then they're going to go right into the 20, or the two mile recovery run afterwards, cool down 20 minutes, right into it, meaning they're not going to stand around, they're going to go right, right into it after the 25 minutes, gets into seven, so the volume is starting to creep up as you can see, um, 35 to 40 minutes, this is um, kind of a, a more challenging day, especially when they're just getting back up on their feet, so I brought it back down, it makes sense for the actual volume at this point. Um, long run, we've got 60 to 65 minutes now, so we're going to be over 60 minutes here in week two. It'll be about eight miles, 20%. Um, bringing back the short hill intervals in, it's still going to be about five miles. Even though we've added one here, it's still going to be about five miles, so we've got 40 miles in week two. Mandated off day, we'll come back and we'll do our first interval workout. This is always a high volume day, um, times five thousands. That's over three miles with the recovery in between. You know, you've got at least another mile in there. You've got your mile to mile and a half warm up with a three mile cool down, at least 25 minutes. Um, and you got eight miles. What I typically do is with my top end kids, if I say two miles, at least 20 minutes. And then for here, I'll say three miles for the that top group. And then everybody else, I'll say at least 25 minutes. When you start seeing four mile cool down, then I'll make it a 35, at least 35 minute cool down as they're doing it. That's kind of how I break it up in my mind. It's not perfect, but it's pretty close. Recovery run, 45 minutes again. Um, keep the tempo run the same for week two. We're at um, we're at seven miles. The long run has stretched out a little bit just because the overall volume. This is really where it adds to it a little bit. Um, same thing here. The fly 30s is a pretty high volume day, just everything all together. So the long run for this week is going to be nine miles. I didn't want to keep it at eight if I'm doing this fictitiously. So it is at the kind of more high end of what you'd want your long run to be, 21.4, but it's still in that safe range. We've got 42 miles this week, a long run of nine. Fly 30s is going to add about eight miles. And then I've got a, a shorter recovery run here of four miles. Certainly we could have extended that a little bit, but this is the first week of having this. This is probably the hardest workout you can do in general prep. So I didn't want to really just, you know, go at them this week. So I kind of pulled off a little bit here, but we're still getting what we need. If you were to kind of plan this out, again, as a fictitious um, macro cycle. Um, got a long run here um, in this next week. Some of the kids are going to be doing a running camp, and that's going to be their day of the long run. That's why I normally just have it as an easy run if they're going to do something on Sunday. I know they're going to be running on this day when they go up to that running camp, essentially. So it's going to be, um, my hope is going to be a long run of 75 to 80 minutes. It's going to be about 10 miles. It'll be 20.4% for that week. Short hill, six, recovery run. This is one thing. They're going to be at this camp where they just have plenty of places to run. So I'm going to stretch this out to 50 to 55 minutes. It'll get them to seven, give them the option of the pickups there. And then 45 minutes on the last day that they'll be there. It'll be six miles. Come back and do a tempo run. We've extended it out to 25 to 30 minutes now. So five miles for that top end group. So that's where we're getting the extra mile in there for eight. Still the same cooldown. Don't need to go crazy with it yet. 
And that's typically what I do is about two miles. Sometimes when I want to keep this at eight, I'll just add an extra pull down mile here. This is about as far as I'll take them on a tempo run. And obviously as their VO2 max improves, their tempo pace will improve. Another 45 minute one for six. We got another VO2 max test. Don't want to get too far away from this because they're going to be improving a lot this time of year. Give them three miles on the back end this time. They can certainly handle it. So it's a six mile day, 49 miles here for week four. Week five um, for general prep, we've got a long run of 80 to 85 minutes. This is going to be the absolute longest extent because we've got an off day here, and I definitely want to increase the total volume. I'll get to July where it sort of finishes out. My hope if I were doing this actual workout plan is I would definitely not want to go from We've got a 10 mile here. Well, I want to add a mile here also, but it's still in the safe zone, 22%. I believe this is the only time when I was kind of playing around with this fake um, macro cycle that we got to 22%, but it's still perfectly fine. Come back with something totally different the next day with the fly 30s, and you've got um, nine miles here. The rest of that week here in July, recovery run again to get to this 50 miles for the week with an off day. you got to stretch it a little bit here, so 50 to 55 minutes on this recovery run seven miles vo2 max intervals same thing as what they did uh, about two weeks before nine miles so it shouldn't hit them quite as hard this time because um, they've done it um they've done this aerobic power work recovery run 50 to 55 minutes um and then we've got a short hill interval here um seven to eight of these this time three miles we're going to get to probably more like seven now that we've um, added a little a couple more reps 50 miles here for week five Week six, this is where we're starting to get into the long runs, right? The the 90 minute long runs. I said this was going to happen in July. Um, we're here in July now. We're week six. We're about halfway through general prep. You should definitely be at your top end extent at this point if they've been running for five to six weeks with you. Um, it should be that kind of gradual increase, but by this point, you should definitely be there. Um, we've got VO2 max. We're going to increase it to thousands and 1200s, thousands for that. Um, less experienced group, 1200s from where your top end group more than likely. Four, uh, three miles on the back end, a nine mile day for that top end group. Recovery run of uh, 45 minutes. Long run, we're at 90, like I said, for the first time. This is close to their top extent, 21.8. They're going to actually get to 55 miles, not quite to 60. And actually, in this sort, as I was playing around with it, I don't think we ever would have gotten to 60 if, if this was a workout plan you were executing it, but it's still keeping within that range. But it's it's between 50 and 60 at, some, at any point, 57. I think there's a 58 or 56 somewhere in here. So 21.8 percent of the weekly miles. If you go 12 that day, come back with some alactic runs, four miles on the back end. Now, um, again, we're adding to it by putting this long cooldown in, as well as making sense on how we're doing the re active recovery, nine mile day, recovery run for six, tempo run. We're going to keep the same thing as we did the uh, the week before, and we're at 55 miles for the week. Come back with general prep week seven, mandated off day, give them a VO2 max test the day after with four miles now on the back end. So now we're at seven miles on our VO2 max day. Come back with a 50 to 55 minute recovery run the next day. Long run, we've got this off day here, so there's no way we're going to be as high volume for the week. We'll go 75 to 80. We got 10 miles or 20.8% of the weekly volume. They've had two weeks where they were really stretching themselves in the long run. They probably need to drop down just a tiny bit, and the volume drops down to 48. Back down to 40 again. You could probably play around with it. I could have put um, this at 60 and this at 60 minutes and get it up to 8 really is is perfectly fine to be in this point that's close enough um they're going to get a decent amount of time their long run is as if it was a 50 mile long run this is you know you've really stretched them here the last little bit you've gone you know steadily increasing you've done these intervals just give them a little bit of something here they won't get less than 50 miles again um probably until you know you start you know getting into a peaking cycle um week eight here um, recovery run, 45 minutes. Um, we've got intervals. We're still at thousands and 1200s. The last time, then we're going to go up the next week. It'll say at nine miles. Recovery run for 60 minutes. Just felt that they, that since they had sort of the shorter week, that they, if you were to plan this out, this would make sense to kind of have a longer. Um, recovery run, it's far away from the long run itself. I also like to give them longer recovery runs from time to time. You'll notice I did that um, up here a couple more times when it makes sense for the volume just because this is such a hard workout. I like to give them something that's so low intensity. It really helps them reset just to give them a little bit more. We're at hills. We're at times eight now. We had two weeks off from hills. We brought them back in three miles. We're at seven. 
total for the day. Recovery run at 50 to 55 minutes, 7 miles. Tempo run, nothing has changed here at all. The tempo runs have been pretty much the same. 8 miles. And we're at another 90-minute long run. We're at 21% because we're going to have 57 miles this week. This is the longest they've run total. They've got the same long run here. The percent just a little bit less because we had a um, higher volume week all the way through it. General prep week 9, mandated off day. Um, VO2 max intervals. Now we've got 1,200s and 1,600s. This is where you really start getting peripheral VO2 max development. We'll talk about this. You know, there's a... There's a video in the description down below that you can see, but also um, we'll talk about this a little bit more in depth when we're talking about the quality of the miles and how your miles are broken down in part two of this. Three miles on the back end, still going to be about nine mile day as you do it. Um, if you do five times 1,200, you're getting 6,000 meters. If you do four times mile, you're getting 6,400 meters. So that's why the mile is about the same. I would not do five times mile repeats. The five for here is probably more for 1,200s for those kids, so they're staying at 6,000 meters or so. Long run, 75 minutes, 80, 75 to 80 minutes. We got 10 miles here. Again, the off day. Um, you want to make sure that that is on point. This is actually, I don't know why I didn't put it here, but I know this is a 50 mile week, so this would be right at 20%. Short hills, we're at seven miles. Recovery run, 50 to 55, seven miles. Tempo run, drop it down just a little bit, um, just because I. I guess I wanted to get right at 50. I guess I was kind of just wanted a real solid uh, actual 50 mile week here. But I dropped it down to 20 to 25 minutes. Um, the idea being this is a hard workout. This is now the, actually the hardest way of doing the hardest workout in general prep. Take one mile off from the tempo run, but you add it to them right here on the cool down on the back end so it stays at eight miles. And yep, um, finish with an alactic day, four miles on the back end, nine miles total. That is 50 miles total. So that long run we had is exactly 20%. Two more weeks in general prep here for mileage, 45 minutes, six miles. Um, medium hills, I haven't done a video on this. It'll be as I transition to looking at specific prep because this is really what's going to transition you to specific prep. Um, you'll do medium hills for a couple weeks in specific prep. Um, that'll be a later video. Um, but as you look at it, it'll be about an eight-mile day. Long run, we're, we're going to stay at 90 minutes here, 21.4. This is a 56-mile week, 21.4% of your weekly volume. A lactic fly 30s, um, nine-mile day. These are kind of close together, um, but again, it's far enough apart. I like to give them about three days. I talk about this in depth in the video on a lactic fly 30, so that's perfectly fine. Tempo run, we're back up to the 25 to 35 um, miles. And then right into the 2-mile, 20, uh, 20-minute cool down, 8 miles total. I did want to kind of give them a little bit more of a shot in the arm here. We kind of shifted this workout in. Um, if I were to do this sort of fictitious uh, planning cycle um, as I was doing it, um, if you wanted to kind of come back up to this point and give them this harder workout and then, and then the test, um, in Florida, our school, actually in Hillsborough County, not all of Florida, um, it can't start before August 10th. So hopefully we have some... Um, return to normal and we're going back to school on on the 10th so that's sort of the idea is us if you were to do this if i were to do this kind of hit them a little bit harder here on this last week before because now they're going to be dealing with a whole different kind of stress as they return to school recovery run 45 minutes six miles vo2 max test um four miles on the back end 56 miles in the last week of general prep as school hopefully starts for us in this fictitious planning cycle keep the same thing um eight miles with the medium hills long run 75 to 80 minutes drop it down to a 50 mile week if we were to run a a workout plan like this when we start school again the stress is going to be higher so you want to take just a little bit off them so this is a 50 mile week 20 percent is perfect tempo run 25 to 30 minutes five miles and then two miles on the back end this might be a situation oops i didn't want to highlight that yeah whatever um this might be a situation where I might drop this down to 4, 20 to 25, and make this 3 miles on the back end, just depending on how they respond to the stress of school. I know that if I were to do something like this, tempo runs are going to start to fade out a little bit more. So I think the idea in doing this here in general prep is it might be the last time that you might be able to get 25 to 30, at least the way I look at it. And you might just be doing um, 4 miles for the rest because you're going to be getting some different workout types in here that the focus needs to be on. Fly 30s, 9 mile day. 45 minute recovery, six mile day, VO2 max intervals. We're staying with the mile intervals or 1200s, three miles on the back end, five miles, 50 mile a week to close out your general prep. So that's why I think that it sort of makes sense when, you know, like I said, once you're sort of at your top and extent, June, you're building your volume. So that's why you've got this 30 mile week here in week one. You got some 40s. But by July, 
targeting 50 to 60 miles. You'll see there's that one week. We talked about it in depth about why that was the case. But for the most part, you're targeting 50 to 60 miles in here. You'll notice we never actually got to 60. You might find that it makes sense. For me, this is where the volume would work if I were doing this sort of a fictitious planning cycle. Things um, obviously are going to change. Like I said, um, we're not allowed to work with our kids, so this is totally fictitious until it would be June 15th. So obviously I'm not going to be able to jump right in and do something like this um, the first day we're going to come back with them. But maybe our state meet gets pushed back. So sort of all those variables. Again, we're just dealing with the hypothetical of September, I'm sorry, November 7th as the state meet and 23 weeks starting on what would have been today. May 25th. So if you like this video, please think about liking or subscribing. If you have any questions, please ask them in the comments down below. Again, I have some uh, videos that I reference in the description down below also. I'll come back in the next day or two with uh, the part two to this where we kind of look at how we break it down. You know, what percentage of our miles for the week are coming from aerobic power, um, alactic, tempo, hills, all those different things, and what one of the, the gurus of running kind of says makes the most sense as you're actually doing this, and we'll kind of go through and we'll do some of these tests. So we really just looked at total volume, central VO2 max, how it lines up um, with you know making sure we're not going too much. Again, that 65 mile per week top end limit for VO2 max development and how it fits in with the long run. So that'll be coming in the next day or two. If you found this helpful, please uh, feel free to share it around. If you do find this helpful, I post about three to five videos a week on different aspects of running. So I would highly, highly encourage you to hit that subscribe button if you have not already. Um, did a couple videos where I kind of showed it. And my su subscriber to unsubscriber watch now is in the positive side of about 54% of the views come from subscribers. But I would love for that to be closer to 100%. So if you are not subscribed and you found this helpful, please hit the subscribe button along with the like button. It really does just show your support for the channel. All it does is maybe recommend it in other people's feeds if they're looking this up. Um, so uh, I would really appreciate it if you would hit that subscribe, hit that like button. It would help me out tremendously. Um, and until next time, this has been Coachy TV.